Good morning, CLC. Thank you for joining us for another lovely Sunday. Hopefully you are having a wonderful week and hopefully we are here welcoming you into another glorious week ahead. And with that, I ask you to join me now in saying, divine love, through me, blesses and multiplies all the good I am and have, all the good I give and receive. I am prosperous now, and so it is. And now, in this moment, I invite you to take a few deep breaths. Relax your body. Relax your mind. Allow any tension, anxiety of stress just to ooze out of you at the moment. Focus your mind and be here now. Universal love enfolds me. Universal wisdom inspires me. Universal spirit enlightens me. Universal power encircles me. I am one and all is well. As we begin the inner healing process, let me invite you to relax in quiet confidence, opening yourself to the miracle working higher power. Now symbolize the unity of your thinking and feeling nature by touching your chest with your right hand and let my words act as your own for your own inner healing, acceptance, and receptivity. I acknowledge that there is a power, intelligence, and wisdom greater than my own. I am in the midst of it, and it is in the midst of me, sensitive and responsive to my every thought, word, action, and feeling. I now make this true for myself by saying aloud, I acknowledge. Acknowledging the higher power working through my life, I admit that I am personally responsible for solving my own problems while being guided and assisted by something greater than myself. As I am ready to surrender the conflicts of my ego to the wisdom of the infinite presence I simply speak these words, I surrender. Knowing that forgiveness is the key to unconditional love and the feeling of heaven, I now unconditionally forgive anyone and everyone who has ever injured me in any way, real or imagined. And I now forgive myself for all of my mistaken judgments and their resulting actions. From my deepest level of understanding, I now say, I forgive. Realizing that I continually experience the effects of my own thinking I now choose to allow this higher power to recreate me deeply, filling my mind with thoughts that are only positive, constructive, loving, and beautiful. I call upon this divine inflow by stating aloud, I choose. I now center upon that one special idea that I'm willing to accept as real for me in this coming week. 
in visualizing that idea as already acted upon and brought to pass, in seeing my idea become a fact of my experience, I enjoy the happiness and peace of my thought fulfilled and gratefully speak these words. I accept. Knowing that I have an everlasting place in the midst of the power that sustains all creation, as well as the support of all those around me, I allow myself to relax in the peace of fulfillment and gratitude and say, I release. Now, in my mind's eye, I envision the presence of someone near and dear to me. This can be a friend, a family member, a teacher or a mentor, someone who has touched my life in deep and loving ways. Someone who may not be physically present in the room with me this morning. I turn toward that image in my mind's eye and say, I am grateful for the good in your life. Now I open my eyes, turn to the world around me, and joyfully speak to anyone who is physically present or virtually on this broadcast and share in gratitude and confidence in saying, I am grateful for the good in your life. Good morning. Hey, all you cats and kittens. Why do I say that? Bill Birch said that. Bill Birch went home this week. He was our Wednesday night music director, our MC, our stage manager. He is beloved. And this is for you. He watched every Sunday. And he commented. And then he send an email later in the day, right? And he'd say, you need help with the sound? I'll, I'll come in, or you might try this, or you might do that. And I hear violin music in my head. So I welcome you here today. Those of you watching know this is part three of a five-part series. So you're right smack dab in the middle of the thing on a process of affirmative prayer called spiritual mind treatment. This is something that Ernest Holmes, the founder of this teaching, developed. He didn't invent it really. He took pieces of it from other teachers. And, but he, he brought it into a particular form. And what it is, it's a form of prayer that you conduct your consciousness to a certain place of acceptance. As I talked about in the first week, it operates on the presumption that the universe is one whole system, that all there is is spirit, that all there is is God. And that being the case, then I am one with that, and you are one with that, and the person who's doing this treatment, who's doing this prayer is one with that. And the goal that they have is one with that. And what they're seeking to be relieved of is one with that. And it, it's, there's an incomprehensible and a vast and limitless oneness in which we pray, in which we speak our word. And today, it's what are we speaking our word about? What are we claiming? What are we asking? What are we knowing? We're knowing something. We're going to have a knowing together. We, we often use that as shorthand and say, I'm having a knowing. I'm speaking my word. I'm declaring something about change, about a new possibility for my life. So today it's about what do we want? What do you want? And how do you know that you want it? And how will you know when you have it? Well, it'll be a feeling. A feeling of achievement, a feeling of having accomplished something. 
It's not about form as much as it's about feeling. There was an article this week, I forget where, I read it and, and I filed it. I said, I got to come back to that. And I was going to come back to it later down the road, but I thought, no, let me come back to it today. And it said this. They did a study of certain individuals, certain group of individuals that they tracked over a number of years. And I'm, I don't know how they found them or who they were or any of this, but the, the question that they were looking for was, does success bring happiness? Does success bring happiness? And they track these people, I guess with surveys and questions and stuff. And the conclusion that they came to in this study, and then they found there were a bunch of other studies being done along the same lines, they all revealed the same thing. They said success does not necessarily lead to happiness. But happiness leads to success. Happiness leads to success. One of the things I discovered in this teaching is that I had had everything pretty much exactly backward in how I thought life and spiritual work got done. Not just jumbled up, but precisely backward. Maybe you do too. Maybe you've thought that if you have something, then you can do something with it, and then you can be something. It's exactly backward. It starts with being, and then doing, and then having. And by the time you have, you're so immersed in the being that the having is just gravy. The having of the thing. When you know that you're a valuable being, when the world provides evidence to that effect, you just assimilate it incorporated and say of course of course this is true of course I deserve this because you first stood in the being of it you've stood in the happiness of it in the place of it you know you know last night Kobe Bryant went into the NBA Hall of Fame or the National Basketball not just the NBA National Basketball Hall of Fame so did Tim Duncan so did Kevin Garnett so did a bunch of other people coaches um, Kim Mulkey the new women's basketball coach at LSU from Baylor, and Vanessa Bryant gave, gave Kobe's speech for him. And she said he would thank, he would thank, I'm paraphrasing me, she said he would thank the people you would expect him to thank. He'd thank his teammates, he'd thank his coaches, he'd thank his parents, he'd thank all the people who helped him. And then he'd thank all the people who told him he couldn't. He'd thank all the people who made him work harder. All of the opponents, not just the opponents on the, the court, but the opponents in society that told him you, you can't have, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Do you know how, do you know how, there's five guys out on that court at a time, times however many teams there are in the NBA, and that's the elite of the basketball world, and who are you to think that you deserve in that small group of highly accomplished people. And what he would have replied would be, I think I'm Kobe Bryant. And I think I'm going to outwork and I'm going to outplay and I'm going to do what I need to do to get to that level. She also brought up, she said, I would say to him, you're, you're tired. They play back-to-back -back games sometimes, and even if they don't, I mean, my God, you know, the, the amount of physical exertion. And she say, you're tired. Why don't you take a day off? Why don't you take a day off? You're a superstar. You can, you can sit on the bench to put somebody in for you. You know, conserve your energy, his wife would say. Probably a lot of other people would say this, too. Yeah. And he never missed a dance recital, and he never missed a school function, and he never missed a picnic, and he never missed a birthday. But she would say, why don't you take a day off and just rest? And he said this. He said, there might be somebody at that game who has scraped together the money to sit up in the third deck to watch Kobe Bryant play. I can't let them down. Did he know that for a fact? How could he? But he believed, and so he pushed himself 
in that way. Why I'm bringing all of this up is, for, well, for three reasons. One is to honor his memory. Another is to make the point that the people that work against you, if you look at it the right way, are working for you. They're working for you. They're working for you in a surreptitious kind of way sometimes. And they're not evil. Some may have evil intent, but many just don't want to see you fail. Have you had a family member do that? i got to be honest with you. When I came into the religious science ministry, you talk about a small group of people on the face of the earth, okay? When I came into the religious science ministry and decided that I wanted to step into this full time, I had well-meaning friends tell me they thought I'd lost my mind. That I should get a real job and have a real career and do something out in the world. And then I read statistics that say your average spiritual center has a shelf life of about five years. Because there's a lot of, if you will, competition. You drove here down this street, there are all these different faith communities, all meeting at more or less the same time, all working for people in the seats, and yet 36 years almost later here we are here we are why why uh, stubbornness um, and a bit of denial I told Reverend Lisa she's what's the topic it's the affirmation with a dash of denial a bit of denial here's the denial how do you use denial in prayer you deny the permanence of the condition you deny that the condition has to exist in the same form and manner that it has up to this point. You deny the prognosis while embracing the diagnosis, meaning the knowing of the day. What's the situation at hand? Am I out of money? Am I out of luck? Am I out of friends? That's the diagnosis. I should know that. If that's the case, I should know that, right? The prognosis is, where is this going? Where am I going to wind up? That's where I exert my will. That's where I have control, is over the prognosis of the situation. What am I going to do with this? What am I going to do with this situation? And have it work out right. And all of this starts when I say in consciousness, it sounds like a vague kind of thing. But it starts in the heart. It starts in the place. Where we were talking about this, I think it was last week. When people say, how do, how do I get the awareness from my head to my heart? I say, it starts in your heart. You weren't taught this. Most of us weren't taught this. We thought, you know, here's a little baby child and you have to be filled with ideas and then you have the ideas and then eventually, you know, you're, you learn how to manage emotions and off you go. But the fact of the matter is we hit town hearts wide open. We come into this world ready to love. So it's the heart that has to be uh, engaged, I guess you'd say in the creation of the dream in the affirmation step or realization step of treatment, this middle step. How would I feel if I could feel any way at all? How would I feel if my dreams were manifested? How would I feel? And am I willing to feel that way? This is where the happiness into success continuum comes along. This is where, am I willing right now Am I willing right now to feel as though my dreams have come true? And if I'm not willing right now, what am I willing? What am I willing to do and what am I willing to feel? Where am I? Where am I in life? And you ask these questions to yourself and you find the blocks that you have. You find the, the misinformation, really, that you'd accepted at some point in time in your life about what was possible for you and now you know that and that's a good thing and you deny that this misinformation has any more power over you than it's already exerted and you affirm for every like I say a dash to denial it's a tiny little bit in the big old seasoning of the meal it's just a little bit of denial mostly it's a, a firm affirm 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 and a little bit of denial as needed. 
Again, somebody may say to you, who do you think you are? More likely you say that to yourself. More likely it comes up within. We are our own opponent. And this is something that every athlete knows and actors know, and any performing person knows, is that it's the voices in your head. It's the stuff, right? You're going you're gonna to blow this big time. You're going to get out on the stage, and you're going to, right? You see this all the time. People are like, I want to go out for the part, you know? I want to go out for the part in the show. They get the part. Oh, that's great. I've told you stories for my own miserable acting career, but you, <laughs> you get the part. Good for you. That's wonderful. Rehearsal. Okay, I know these people. I can do this in empty room opening night. Who do you think you are, right? Hovers, hovers in the mind. Hovers in the mind. I was reading about uh, uh, Carol King. She, uh, we, we do some Carol, Carol King from time to time. And um, she's going into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this year for the second time. The first is a songwriter with Jerry Goffin. This time as a performer, she's the first woman to go into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as a non-performer and performer. It's pretty remarkable, huh? So they were talking to her, they said, you haven't, you haven't toured in a while, you haven't performed in front of anybody once. No, I haven't, you know. So I'm, I'm getting up there, she says. Uh, well, are you going to perform that night? Well, I will if they ask me. Do a couple of songs. They say, well, they usually do a jam at the end. Are you going to do a jam? Jay-Z's going to be there. There's a Todd Rundgren. I know six or seven going in to the, to the uh, Tina Turner. Tina, how would you like to be on stage with Tina Turner? Are you going to perform? She said, well, yeah, if they do a jam at the end. She said, I hope they rehearse. I hope they rehearse, because I, I don't know, you know, if I could keep up, they don't rehearse. They said, well, now you realize it's not like it was when you went in the first time, when the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame event was basically in a, like, hotel ballroom, and people sat at the tables and had dinner, you know. You can see the old videos, the rounds at 10, you know, people sitting in their seats. It's just, no. This one is going to be in an arena, 20,000 people. 20,000 people are going to be there. They said, how do you feel about that? You, you're rusty now. You haven't performed in the walk. Can you sing before 20,000 people? She said, I think I can manage it. She said, the last tour I was on in 2016, I sang at Hyde Park in London in front of 62,000 people. So I think I can do it. But whether it's 62,000 or 20,000 or 12 or 2, the same butterflies can come up, the same you're going to blow it, you're going you're gonna to gag, you're going to choke, you know? Where does that come from? Is that the devil? Is that malicious, uh, I don't know, energy, magnetic energy being beamed at you from people you were rude to or who just don't like you? Or is it out there in the collective consciousness of things? This is to be above average. To be above average, you got to risk. You got to put yourself out there. What I know to do with that is not ignore it, not try to drown it out, but turn and face it and say, Who are you? Where do you come from? And what are you teaching me? And often what will happen is it will track back to the time when you got called on in, I don't know, fourth grade spelling and you didn't have the answer and they made you stand up and the other kids laughed at you and you made a pact. You made a pact with the universe in your mind at that time that never again will I suffer such humiliation. Years have gone by, that's long forgotten, but for one little part of you that still holds on to it as a safe thing. And so you turn and you talk to it and you ask it and it'll tell you and you get your power back. You realize I'm not who I was. Plus I learned something from that experience. Be prepared. 
if you're in spelling class, have some spelling ready, you know, right? You learn something from that. It made you a more involved, engaged person, and so you get your power back. And so then we speak the word to conditions, but not about conditions. We speak the word to conditions about oneness. We speak the word about the truth that we know of the connection of all things. We say, there's good for me, as um, Florence Scovel Shin put it, there's good for me and I ought to have it. One last thing, two last things, two and a half, anyway. Um, in the emails that went out this week, the constant contact, uh-oh, I mentioned a vendor. Um, the constant contact emails that go out every week, which I encourage you to sign up for if you haven't yet, so you know everything that's going on. And you can say it along with Danielle when she gets up here and goes through the announcements, and we can all recite it together, you know, Wednesday night, soul session. Well, in there this week, I put at the footer, there's always like an inspiring quote of some kind. I put a piece in there from an awesome book that Jeffrey Oshman here told me about. When we did a series a few years ago on manifesting, and he said, have you ever heard of this? Remember the Laws of Manifestation, David Spangler. It's an awesome book. And I put a line in there about manifesting. In this step, this realization, Spangler points out, nobody does it alone. It's all collaborative. And if you want something, whatever it might be in your life, are you willing to have anyone else have it as good? Your worst enemy, the people who hurt you, the people who are mean to you, are you willing to have them have it too? Or the equivalent, you know, in terms of joy. And if you're not, that's limiting you. It might not even be limiting them because they have their own relationship with spirit. This, of course, goes to forgiveness. It goes to all manner of human interaction and relationships. Everybody gets what, by right of consciousness, what they themselves draw down. And I can't. I can't limit that. I can give them bad information if I have to, but I can't limit that. I can give them good information, but I can't increase that. No one else can do it for us. No one else can do it to us. So am I willing to have everybody thrive? If I'm willing to have everybody thrive, I'm certain to thrive. Not only that, but people are going to come from like nowhere you know, appear suddenly in my life with the information that I need, with the contacts and context that I need for my life. People will bring me their friends and other relations and stuff who will have something. And you've had this happen when you've been on, in the flow, when you've been on a roll where one thing leads to another. You find the, uh, you find the dusty old business card in your desk drawer. You don't even remember who it was, when you got the card, who gave it to you, but something about it says maybe call this person, you know, or email them or go to their website, and there you find information that leads to something else, that leads to something else. I tell you, it's just absolutely amazing. I'll tell you a story, not now, but I, um, in June, when we start the June series, which is going to be based on a book by Madeline Lengel. I'm going to tell you the story of how that series came to be. And it's one of these woo-woo things. You know what a woo-woo thing is? It's like, you know, right? Mysterious and, and eerie and cool. And it works. I think it works. We'll see how you feel about the June series once you hear it. And you don't need to outline. And this is the thing. Every opponent that, for instance, Kobe Bryant had on the basketball court. Was somebody else's teammate. Right? 
They weren't everybody's opponent on the face of the earth. They were his opponent within the confines of an agreement that we're going to play ball here and one team is going to win and one team is going to lose. <clears throat> and the number of losses and wins are going to be calculated up and there'll be a tournament at the end and then there'll be a champion crown. And then you know what? Next year we're going to start the whole thing all over again. All the statistics are, are zed out, the, right? And within the context of that agreement. And so it's a game. It's a game, including opposition. Opposition can be a game. You can interpret it as a game. Competition, you can interpret as a game. In the overall universe, there is no competition. Why? There's only one. It has nothing to compete against. But within that system, there are subsets of agreement. We say you want to play a game, whether it's, you know, Monopoly or golf or what have you. You want to play a game. Well, one of us is going to win and one of us is going to lose. And it's just a statistical thing. You want to compete for a job. You want to compete. Now the housing market's crazy. I'm reading and it's like people are paying, you know, astronomical sums over the ask price over the ask price for a certain, it's a game. And then things change and then the price goes down. And like the stock market, man, the stock market is a perfect example of this because everybody speculates on where it's going to go and nobody knows. As a matter of fact, if you know and you speculate, that's a crime, <laughs> okay? It's called insider trading, you know? You have some information. It's like you, you gotta you gotta not have the information and you gotta step into the thing. So these are the structures. So don't get sucked into the belief that there's somebody acting in full time all out opposition to who you are. And focus instead on what you believe about yourself. And I will leave you with this next point, which is simply this. For you to have it, you got to believe it. It's not so much about what kind of God you believe in and what sort of theology you believe in and what you believe was meant by various sacred scriptures. That's all well and good, but when it comes down to the real question of what you're going to manifest in your life, how much of your good are you willing to believe in? You are the only person that you have to convince. So, if you say to yourself, well, you know, I'd like to do thus and such, and immediately you follow it up with, yeah, right, like that'll happen. Well, what that's telling you is you don't believe it yet. Nobody else is going to believe it for you. Nobody else can. So what can you believe? And it's not to say you, you can't believe the big things, but start with the things that are smaller and believable to move toward the big things. So Florence Shin, I think it was, who I quoted earlier, had a saying. She said, every day, remember this? Every day, in every way, I am getting better and better. That's been adopted by some other organizations, too. Every day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. Can you believe that? Sir. Tim Duncan, who went into the Hall of Fame is from the Virgin Islands, which I had forgotten. He played for the Spurs here, you know, for years and years, alongside David Robinson, the Admiral. When he thanked people last night, uh, oh, I could go on and on, but I'll give you this. This is your mantra for the week, if you'll have it. He said, my mother in the Virgin Islands time I was this big, his age, he's telling me this, good, better, best, never let it rest till your good is better and your better is your best. Okay, let me give you that again. Good, better, best, never let it rest till your good is better and your better is your best. And here stands this man at the pinnacle of his profession, his chosen profession telling you that his mother used to say this. I'd say it works. I'd say it works. This is not somebody on the way to. This is somebody who, right, has done it, has been there, and is now bringing back to all of us 
this wisdom. It's your best, it's your better and your best that you work on in life. And you turn the next corner, magic happens. Thank you very much. Here's some more music. At the end of this service, Reverend Lisa is going to actually do a five-step spiritual mind treatment so you can hear how the whole thing flows out. And I love you guys, and I'll see you next Sunday. But it's Danielle said, please watch Wednesday night. Reverend Miyoki, Kane Barrett, uh, Nietzsche Ren, Buddhist Bishop of North America on this stage. We will be speaking together in conversation. I can't wait to see her. I can't wait to do that. can't wait to see everybody. It's been way too long. So now some more music, and here we go. Okay, what was that song? Skyboat song. Skyboat song, okay. One of the things I love about having Mary here is when you watch Facebook Live, you get to hear this amazing music, but I have to take it out for the YouTube because YouTube has rules, but I can leave instrumental music in, so I get to leave that song in for the YouTube crowd. I'm very excited about that. All right. Um, I encourage you to watch both. <laughs> Please watch the, watch the live so that you can hear the amazing live music because we have amazing musicians here. Uh, they rotate through and they come up with amazing stuff every week. And frequently one of the things that they do is they'll take a song that we all know and then you hear it on a stage in a sacred space and you go, then you hear the sacred undertones. So 
that's the beautiful thing about music. It has many, many levels. Many levels. And in that, because, you know, there's no pressure with me doing the closing treatment <laughs> at all. <laughs> so what we're going to do really quickly is review the five steps. And let's see if I remember all of the names. Uh, well, first, there's recognition, unification, realization, thanksgiving, and release. So I'm going to attempt to do that as I'm doing the treatment, but hopefully I'll make it clear to you which step is which. So we're all teachers, and sometimes we're being taught. So the first is knowing of the one. There is one power, one presence, one life, one love in all of the universe. In infinity, there is one. And I am a part of this one. That love flows through me. That presence lives in me. That power flows through me. I am made up of that one. I am a tiny, infinitesimal, small part of that one. But the cool thing about being part of that is no matter how small I am, all of that power is available to me. And as I know this about myself, that I know that I am part of that one. So too do I know it about each and every one of you. You are part of that one. That presence lives in you. That presence loves through you. And so I speak my word now in the knowing that we know who we are, that we have that feeling, that we are willing to accept that good, the good that we are, the good that we have, the good that we see. And as we are willing to accept the good, we are willing to expand our acceptance of that good. We're willing to be open to more, to new, to different. We are open to new experiences. We're open to new contacts. We are open to new contracts. We are open to new feelings. We are open to up-leveling. We are open to a world that works for everyone. And in this knowing, I am grateful. I am grateful because there is no power greater than gratitude. There's no power greater than gratitude because gratitude is simply another word for love. And I'm grateful to know this. I'm grateful to feel this. I'm grateful to know you. I'm grateful to know here. I am grateful for all of the people that bring these lessons into my life. Even if in the moment they look like an opponent. Because an opponent today can be, an op can be a friend and teammate tomorrow. And I know this with all of the gratitude of my being. And now comes that step called release, where I know it and I let it go. Because it is not, th it is not by me that these things are done. It is through me that these things are done. So I let go, and I let God, and I know that as I speak these words, spirit and law are bringing them to me. So I release, and know it is so, and so it is. <laughs>